Shoot. Hey, we want to thank everybody for being on. I, and I apologize because I can't see your faces, but I know that we have a great group on. Uh, I know we're all dealing with some really crazy times right now. And so here at Tracer and, the, and with the Tracer family, we really are looking forward to the opportunity to start to provide some added value, some additional um, educational platforms that we can all share, we can all come together, we can all get better. Uh, not only to flush out some of the current pain points that, that you know, we're all dealing with and that you in particular are dealing with, but also to look at how we can continue to provide more value here at Tracer um, and through a lot of the resources that we have and connections that we have. And so um, right now I tell our group consistently that this is not a time to decelerate, it's really a time to accelerate. And for us, rather than tucking our tail between our legs, we're really excited to start to look at where by next week, we're launching a new website uh, that we're really excited about, new brand, uh, and really looking at, we've had a lot of opportunities now to take a step back and look at what are the pain points and how can we provide more value. And so we're looking at a lot of different technology developments um, that we're excited to launch here over the next four to eight weeks that hopefully will provide a lot of value to the marketplace and to your patients and to your users. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to introduce for our first webinar, Dr. Mike Voigt. Uh, Dr. Voigt um, has too many accolades to <laughs> rattle off on this call, but primarily is, is both a professor at Belmont and Vanderbilt and also the head of clinical for Dr. Bird's National Hip Institute there in Nashville. Uh, and in, in my personal opinion, one of the best musculoskeletal clinicians in the world and uh, provides a lot of value. And so we're excited to introduce Mike and listen to Mike's presentation on utilizing technology to optimize rehab. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike and then we're going to bring it back to me and I'm going to do a little bit of a live demo of some of the things we're doing with Tracer today and then we'll open it up to a question and answer for the group. So Mike, uh, feel free to go. Thanks Barry and, and again it's fun and I, I've got to, to see I've been be coming through all this two things. I have to give an apology right off the bat. It's been uh, uh, over the last uh, I guess month we've been doing it. I need a haircut. If this thing goes much longer, I'm gonna have a mullet before it's all said and done. So uh, I gotta figure that one out uh, with it. But this is great to do this. And I looked at the participant or attendee list and I saw a bunch of my friends on the list that are there. Uh, and some of you on the room, Connor and Ron and the group down in Georgia and stuff, you guys know a lot about this too. And they're certainly using this in certain ways and you'll uh, hopefully we'll, we'll share a little bit. And at the end, we can have a dis uh, discussion about it. What I wanted to do here, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna pull this up, uh, share. Perfect, I wanted to go through and just, and this is a talk Barry asked me to share with you guys. And it's, it's one I've used to, to uh, talk to individuals about why, uh, how do I make decisions? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna slant this to Tracer towards the end, but this is, the, this is the process largely that what I'm gonna get to is the process of how I decide uh, how to integrate something into my clinical practice. Like many of you that are on this call and the webinar that I recognize, you, I know you guys are bombarded with, with new technology all the time. So hopefully I wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, I do wanna give a little background because movement is my area of research and things I, I look at with it. And I think the, uh, the first step in the process that we come up with, if I can get my slides here to advance, here we go. First thing I sort of look at is why do we need to even look at movement assessment? And everybody sort of defines thing a little bit different, but I, I, I sort of take a big picture back when we, when we go through the process. And believe it or not, that is a real video of our military trained people in, out in the, the Afghanistan, but everybody defines things different. And I think the, the issue, if you go back and look at what we do, and, and, and we're a little bit different because we're talking about musculoskeletal, but if you look at what we do, eye, dental, heart, they all have screens and we look for signs or problems before symptoms even present. And in the dollars of this, if we look at annual healthcare dollars, eye care, you know, 31 billion, and these numbers are obviously lagged behind because CDC uh, assimilates these. So these are several years behind, it only goes up. But if you look at some of these preventive dollars, we're looking at over, you know, almost $750 billion being spent on this. When in reality, if we think about musculoskeletal care, we're backwards in what we do. In Typically with musculoskeletal, we wait for symptoms to come out and then we arbitrate value of the signs we think contribute to the problem. But we usually wait for things to manifest. So why is this important to us? Well, I know many of you have sort of seen these next series of slides we, we're gonna talk about, but if you identify and address movement faults, 
or by identifying and addressing movement faults, quite possibly it could result in improved movement quality. And, and I would say this is a, a big if, big if, I, I think that because there's so many variables involved with injury, but it could uh, quite possibly minimize the risk of injury. We look at it. Now, I say it could minimize the risk of injury. What do we really know about injury or going through that? Well, you guys have seen these slides before. What's the best predictor of athletic injury? And, and there's lots of studies that have looked at this. And you look at what the best predictor of it, athletic injury is. Well, it's pretty simple. It's a previous injury. Now, granted, if I go to the literature and look at it, there's multiple prospective studies that look at this that have shown for previous injury being a significant risk factor. But here's the variable that's kind of crazy. But it's not if you really think about it. In that if you look at the injury risk, depending on this previous injury, it's two to 19 times greater risk. Now you think to yourself, that's a quite a big range. Why would you have a 19 or two times risk? Well, the reason the risk factors is different, or we have risk factor on this, it's what is the individual going back to? Uh, for example, I could probably get it to almost zero risk if I was going back to be a professional chess player or a checker player, my risk of re-injury is probably pretty remote. On the other hand, going back to, you know, uh, Georgia football or going back to, you know, high contact activity, the reality of it is my risk is going to be much greater. The other thing we do know about this is that risk seems to increase gradually with the number of previous injuries, and it will also decrease with time since the previous injury. Again, I think that's a common sense statement. Uh, look at that. There was a really good study done in Europe through FIFA with soccer. And they actually did the same thing, trying to look at risk uh, through the FMARC, the FIFA Medical Commission. And, and they actually had looked at over 16,000 injuries, and they were trying to see trends. And these were done through countries and club teams, but I mean high-level club teams. And what they basically found was the same thing. The only thing they could seem to correlate at all to predicting whether somebody might have an injury down the road is had they been injured before. Now, to me, I think that's kind of an interesting concept. Because the reality of it is, if, if that's a true statement, who owns that problem? I, I, and I think you got to really think about this. If previous injury is a predictor of future, then I look at who owns the problem, and I have to think we own some of that problem. I mean, it's certainly in contact sports and explosive sports and high-level sports, all kinds of crazy things will happen. I get it. I mean, there's variables we just can't control. But some of this I think we can control. And the key question that I look at with this all the time is, why do these highly trained individuals sustain non-contact injuries? If you're already in great shape, why are they getting hurt? And why is previous injury the number one risk factor for recurrence? And if you look at the big picture of, of an overview of intrinsic factors, certainly we see it start in the upper left corner. We, we can see a previous injury is a predictor for subsequent injury. And there's lots of variables that come into this increased injury risk. But the one that I like to focus on and look at here, to me, uh, things, and we can, we can certainly modify a lot of these variables, I get it, but the poor movement quality or decreased range of motion is a concern to me when I look at it. And so ultimately, I think this is what's going on. Either we're not fully rehabilitating or restoring function in our patients, or something fundamentally or structurally changes after injury. And, and, I, and I think of that way is that I'd like to think that we're probably doing rehabilitation correctly, but if you think about the way we rehabilitate and the things we rehabilitate or look at, most of our decision-making to date is based upon three things. And you could put a fourth one in there, there's a few other variables, but think about traditional rehabilitation. We focus on pain because they come to us, something hurts. They're, we're going to address that. That's, their, that's the validator of why they want to come see us. They have pain. So they're going to, nobody comes in just because they don't move, right? That something's bothered them to bring, that validates it. We look at range of motion and think about our goals post rehab or doing things. Uh, we'll look at the full pain-free range of motion. Might be one of your long-term goals. Um, restore uh, adequate or full strength, power, endurance, those type of things. But pain, range of motion, strength is in there. And then maybe we throw an ADL or some functional goal on that on top of that. But in my mind, if we look at it this way, clearly there's a problem in the way we're managing previous injury. Because that clinical outcomes of being an as of asymptomatic function or normal range of isolated joint motion or isolated muscle function, they're not adequate rehabilitation endpoints to prevent reoccurrence. And, and, and for me personally, 
I, I think it's something I'm used. So don't take this the wrong way that I that I um, don't look at these things. These are low level things for me on the foundation. Those typical measures of range of motion and strength, they're not able for me to detect fundamental changes in motor control uh, following injury or surgery. So I, I've used this slide a bunch in my mind of, of what are we doing in the clinic and what we need to be doing, sort of that iceberg effect. I think some of us, we just, and, I, and I'm picking on myself, so I'm not picking on anybody in attendance today, myself, from my old school way of training is I look at those isolated joint function measures. If it was a knee injury, I was the master at putting the blinders on and I could really figure out what's going on at the knee and maybe above and below a little bit on an ACL tear or some of these things. But just because I got range of motion back to 100% and just because their strength, power, endurance was as good, if not better than the other side or before, didn't necessarily mean they're gonna go back to the highest level of function. And I'm reminded of this quote from Dr. James Syriax, who would be the father of modern orthopedic medicine. It's well to remember that the object of physical examination is to find the movement that elicits the pain of which the patient complains, rather than some other nebulous symptom of which he was previously unaware. And that's a real powerful statement because with anatomical variants, when we examine patients, we can find all kinds of variations. I just got done doing a lecture on looking at forefoot, hindfoot, relationships. And yes, you can get in there and start looking at two and three degrees of movement changes in a hind foot or forefoot and go through various things like that. That's all well and good, but there's variations of normal there that uh, not everybody's the exact same number. So I can find abnormal anatomical variations. It doesn't necessarily mean that's my problem. What I really need to do is look at my movement. So that sort of gets me fast tracked as my introduction here is that I, I think we kind of have a new paradigm of how we should look at things. And our old paradigm, as I was just talking about, is that we focus treatment and ultimately our corrective exercises on a faulty anatomical part. They have a knee injury. They have a shoulder injury. They had an ankle injury. They have a hip injury where I work now doing things. We've got to get away from that and focus treatment in our corrective exercises at faulty movement patterns, while at the same time, we consider the integrity of the anatomical part. So I'm not suggesting that if somebody had an ACL tear, they have a hip injury or an ankle injury, I am not suggesting that we ignore that and just go to total movement assessment. I'm saying I'll take that into consideration. We'll address that. But I really, what I'm most concerned about is getting that person back to the highest level of performance and the highest level of, of play. And that's going to be restoring their movement patterns. So having said all that, where do we start? And this is the part I was talking about with technology. And I know some of you in the training rooms and in these high-end clinics, we're bombarded with stuff coming out every day. The abundance of technology and, and certainly wearables is the big thing and trying to get all this information. I think it's easy for us to get um, certainly confused about what's actually gonna help us with our patients to, to achieve our big time picture, our goals that we're looking at. As I sort of said, we're bombarded with new technology every day. And I have to go through this checklist in my mind and think to myself, how do I decide whether I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole or I'm gonna go down that road in trying to incorporate this, whatever the technology is, new technology into my practice. And I think as I do that process or one of the overarching um, questions that I ask or I look at is I try to remember this, the technology that does not enhance or change practice to me is useless. I see all kinds of things come out and they come across my desk here at the university or it comes across the clinic at the hip clinic with our athletes that come in and I see all kinds of crazy things and it's like, yeah, but this is probably not going to do anything different or going to get me from A to B any faster. It, it, there might be some nice bells and whistles and, and sort of there's things that can motivate athletes. There's things that could do this, but I look at it and think that does it, if it's not overarching, if it doesn't enhance, or change my practice, then to me, it's kind of useless technology. Now, having said that, I said to you guys, how do I decide? What are the questions? And I have a series of questions I'm just gonna go through that I ask on every piece of equipment or technology that comes in. And the first thing that it kind of goes with that, will it change my practice? Will the technology or information provided be helpful? Is there a need for it? I, we've all seen crazy things or, you know, infomercials where something's developed and it's like, hey, that's pretty interesting, but it, it's, there's not really a need for this thing. Is there even a need for what I'm doing? 
to get or for this information to help me? And is it going to be helpful in the delivery of care? That that's sort of one of my litmus tests that I might ask first when I look at um, does it is it going to be helpful to anything that I do in clinical practice? Probably the next big question, or it is the next big question I go to is, can you trust the information being provided? And I'll say that again. Can you trust the information provided? We, we get lots of tool, tools and toys brought to us and we'll play with it. And it gives me all kinds of numbers. And we as clinicians make a huge assumption here. We make a huge assumption that anything that comes to practice, if it gets to, if it gets to us from a manufacturer or it gets to us from a, our wholesalers or our, our people that are out selling this to us, uh, then it must be a good tool and it's been well done. But, but that doesn't mean anything. There are, there are some tools that are out there that are the, the numbers we get mean absolutely nothing. Is there a sufficient level of reliability and validity of data? Just to recap it with reliability, meaning if I test today, there's all kinds of levels of reliability, but basically what I'm talking about here or definitions of reliability, but basically what I'm talking about is if I did a test today and I do a test an hour from now or the next day or the next day, am I going to get the same information between tests? If there's variability between testing, how can I ever use that information that's going to be uh, uh, to make a decision on it if I can just get a change every time I do the test? Likewise, validity means Am I measuring what I say I'm measuring when I look at it? Now, we can intersperse reliability and validity on this a little bit. I think they're both important. To me, reliability is the most important. I can figure out my validity on certain things afterwards that I might be uh, getting consistent numbers and I'm a little bit off on something uh, as I compare it to the gold standard. But we want to know, is it reliable? What's the measurement error? How much variability is there in the measuring device? A classic example, goniometry. What's the measurement error on a goniometer, a standard goniometer? It's plus or minus five degrees. Okay, so if I'm measuring something and I see that there's a three degree change in motion, well, that's probably not even clinically significant. It's within the measurement error. It might be that it was accurate. Uh, we use joint arthrometers at the knee to look at ligamentous laxity, uh, millimeters of laxity, plus or minus on our KT2000 two millimeters. All right, well, anything within two millimeters could just be a difference of the device itself. And is it sensitive enough to detect change, which kind of goes along the same lines. The reason I'm kind of harping about measurement here is this. It's the old Peter Drucker line that, that we sort of look at. If, if you can't measure it, I can't improve it. And that's an important thing. I want to know what I'm looking at. I need to define my problem. As an example, I, I kind of like this old proverb that's up here. You can't fatten a cow by weighing it. Improvement's not about just the measurement itself. The measurement helps me know if there's a change. Uh, it, there's improvement in what I'm doing. So if I can't measure it, I can't improve it. So in another sense that I put on my slide, measurement to me leads to understanding. Understanding leads to control. Control leads to improvement. So that's what I'm using my measurements for. Now, other things I question on this, this is a big one for us as clinicians. It might be not for a researcher, but for a clinician. Is the information provided easy to analyze, easy to use. In other words, what format is that information in? Does it require extensive analyzing for clinical use? Do you have the tools and time expertise to, to analyze the data? Some of us on the, the call today on our, our thing know about going back, you know, we're just, I heard the new word one of my students told me today, we're seasoned. We're not just old, we're seasoned. But I remember the days using motion capture in the early days. Yeah, a great tool to look at movement and go through things and some of our athletic endeavors we looked at, but it might have taken me to analyze one person. I could, by the time I set it up, collect data and analyze all the, digitize the points and analyze it, I'm five or six hours into this. Well, that's not clinically applicable. I might answer a research question, but I'm not going to be able to do this in the, in the clinic on a regular basis. So is it easy to analyze, easy to use is a big one for me when I look at it. Likewise, we be easily able to implement the technology into practice. Obviously, in some cases, in our big time athletics and things we do, cost is less of a concern, but time efficiency is. You got a lot of athletes to deal with. So is, it a, is there a time efficiencies on there, the burden when we look at it? And I think if you look at those four questions and I, I sort of put them all together, I, I come up with my overarching decision making. Will this new technology inform or potentially change the delivery of my care. Now let's take these questions and our overarching question and I'll apply it to looking at some new technology. And this is where I, I use Tracer. I love the company. I've, I've, I've literally, as Barry will attest later, I, I can remember it seasoned. We were seasoned. 
uh, looking at this, but I can remember following and working with the company from virtually day one when we had the Biotran and used various technology with it. And what we're really looking at with this to me, and, and I'll, I'm gonna really jump to my last slide because this checked all my boxes. Because with Tracer, as we moved into the current format, and like I said, I, I don't need to go back in our history how we used it, but in our current format solves a big problem. And, and the problem to me is this, it's more of my, even though I'll talk a little bit about how I do it for rehab and do things with rehab, it's really my assessment for return to performance and looking at these things down the road that possibly, they certainly contribute to performance, but could possibly contribute to injury as well. And that's looking at things like our conventional tests of agility and speed. How do we do this? Well, typically, if we, and I'm going to give an example, a great example coming up, we use a stopwatch. Most of our things, we, we do two things, excuse me. We have one other thing we use. We either use a stopwatch, where we time a test, or we use a tape measure, where we see hops, jumps, things like this to see. Uh, if we think about a, a linear course, like a 40-yard dash, okay, that's a stopwatch. We look at it. Agility testing. That's a stopwatch. We look at it. And, and I do think there is an element here of elapsed time can ultimately serve to compare one athlete to another, or it could potentially compare my performance over time. But for me to, I, I would certainly need more detail to manage effective return to play decisions and performance programs, because it really tells me nothing about movement quality. That's your subjective watching the person do it. And you, we sort of think of it when we watch our athletes go through these drills and do things, carriage control, confidence, you know, how do they carry themselves, control, can they stop and start without undue stress, just their confidence in moving. Those are relatively subjective things we, we use to, to do this, we put on there. To me, with Tracer, we can maximize, uh, in order to maximize our ability and to move, we must be able to measure reaction times. And, and then to me, the ability to start, stop, and cut. So with movement, Tracer to me delivers planned and unplanned uh, cues. Uh, I'll show you this coming up in a second here. We can measure. I I'm measuring things that I previously couldn't measure and give data. I certainly have my stopwatch. And I can still look at that. But, but as far as looking at quality of movement, I can put values to that. And, and don't discount the last one. Uh, to me, this is as much um, as much of what I do in rehab and more than anything else is the motivation. Um, anytime you challenge an athlete, and I'm going to even say my patients, because they're all athletes, they're all active people, and you sort of stir up their competitive juices, you get them going. Uh, I have people ask me all the time, and I do certain drills, they want to know what the high score is. I mean, they're used to younger kids, or they're used <laughs> to playing video games, and I think it puts fun back in functional, sort of making it competitive for improved motivation. They want to get a high score, they want to hold the record in what we're doing. Now, I know uh, we're going to hear about the future coming up and things we're doing, but how does this work or Tracer work? Basically, and, and I, I just put this in because um, I don't sometimes want to look stupid, so I'm going to say this to everybody uh, on the webinar today. It took me a long time to figure it out because I sat there and looked at it and looked at my device and played with it, and I couldn't figure out how, how the, for the life of me how a two-dimensional camera can put me into a game and I can run through protocols and do things, and then I realized I think I actually did ask Barry uh, the answer to this. I realized it wasn't the camera that was necessarily doing things. It was the infrared range finders on the device that was digitizing parts on my body. And you'll see this in a video I've got coming up, but we could digitize parts to objectively capture movement in real time. Real fast, you know, the ecosystem of what we're talking about up in green at the top, balance, kinematics of movement, dynamic movement, neuromechanics. These are all things I look at I call them the modalities in a sense, but that brings us into three levels underneath with my application, assessment, training, rehab. And quite honestly, of the five sort of micro data steps that I look at, and you'll see lots of the first four here, is that I look at with all my decision making is reaction time to a stimulus, how fast can somebody run, how quick can they accelerate to a target, and how fa what's their deceleration capabilities when they get to what they're doing. Obviously, we can apply this to athletes, seniors, all of our patients. Soldiers are a big one with this. We certainly have used this with our special forces operators and, and run data on it, which I can share a little bit. But just to uh, specifically put this in place, let's go back to something that recently happened this spring. Let's look at a combine. One of the tests that's used, and I mentioned this earlier, the shuttle run. That's a, a classic test that, the, that the, uh, the NFL uses at the combine. 
in Indianapolis, and here's just my little video, but it's, it's a drill that looks at lateral quickness to explosion over a total of 20 yards, it has participants sprinting three different directions. They go with three, three point stance, they sprint out five yards to the right, bend down, touch, turf, go back the other direction. So then they go back and then they sprint back, it's 10 yards to the left and touch the ground again. They look at this drill and coaches uh, test this lateral quickness, explosive agility. But as we look at this, the reality of it is, as these people are going through it, the reality of it is what the, the measure that's traditionally used with this is going to be time. It's your stopwatch. How fast did they do it? Okay, you went through it in 7.06 seconds. Excellent. And that's, that's, that is a tool that you could use. But the reality is if we can break this down even more and look at it, and see how quick did they react to a stimulus? What was the top speed they achieved? Which would potentially, potentially correlate to the time, although there's two other variables that come into this. What's their start time or acceleration time, the, their, their first step quickness, and how quick could they decelerate? Their ability to decelerate, break, and change directions. Those are important things to me. So as an example, as I just sort of walked you through this, this is the, the reactive agility screen. I just pulled up the screen and you can sort of see the test, how easy it is to get into what I'm doing. It's going to start up the, the testing here and the person <clears throat> is going to be digitized into the game. So you'll see the person holding their hands up. They're now digitized. It'll say, get to your start position. The machine counts down, go. And they're going to have to move around and they obviously are chasing the bumpers to wherever it is randomly all over. So the athlete doesn't really know which what direction they're going. Now, obviously, if you're at the far right hand side of the quadrant that you're in you know you've got to be go you're not going to go any further that direction you got to come back the other way but just to keep you honest we could have you going forward or back or if you're already at the, the most forward position we could see where you were with this and if I just jump it ahead here and you look at my screen I'll get a I get a report like this now this is a test one versus two over time but my report's telling me the reaction time and notice how this is set up as these these radials these these radials I'm getting, I can get your information on each of these reaction time, top speed, acceleration, and deceleration, whether you're going forward, backward, right or left, and then forward, right, forward, left, backward, right, backward, left. So you can see the radials, and that's just drawn out here. Red was test one, uh, blue is test two, but it's just showing you, you can, the graphics on the, my vector test that I look at this. I can just quickly look at it and see, oh yeah, they don't, they're having trouble moving one direction or another. Or I actually have the true numbers underneath that I can look at and come up with numbers. And I, I can know uh, from test one to test two whether they're getting better or they've, they've decreased in what they do. Another big one that we use in the clinic quite a bit is the lateral agility, particularly with our hip clinic. We use this quite a bit with our hockey players. I use it with uh, even my football players, as you'll see in a second. And it's just moving side to side, and they got to get back to my start positions. You can see Barry doing the test with this. But just a couple other videos of doing the, the activity where you can see the athlete chasing it around and having to get to the bumpers, uh, whether it be in the clinic or we can do this in large training uh, spaces where they're working back and forth. And I'm looking at their overall movement. Uh, obviously big in the news in the last year. Um, looking at this, particularly if there's an ankle injury, the Georgia boys can close their eyes on this one. I know they're on today uh, with our uh, talking. But if you had an ankle injury, we're looking at a Division One quarterback. We can look at how well they move side to side with doing this. Or again, potentially, if your quarterback had a hip injury, we could work on lateral movement drills and do things. And this is something we just threw together for the call today. But uh, you can just see this is in the clinic with us. But moving side to side, I can check to see. Again, I'm looking at lateral quickness. <clears throat> I'll let this play for a second because I do two different things with them. As again, we do this with our hockey players as well as they move. But we can have them move side to side. Uh, again, this would be four months, five months post hip surgery. But the moving side to side, and we can see various things. And then I'll get my reports will come up. And I do this for endurance as well. So you can just see some numbers for deceleration times right to left. He's within, well, within 4% or reaction times, he's again within a 5% on his reaction times going forward. I also wanna see as a quarterback, his linear, linear agility going forwards and backwards, largely backwards, not the forward, but I wanna see quickness going in this plane as well. And I'll move him back and forth and just see what he can do uh, reacting to this. And then obviously as a rehab program, we can compare it to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 
And then we are collecting as a company, they're collecting normative data we can go back and look at. So on our side to side movements, I can get information like this, where I can see reaction time laterally, speed lateral, uh, acceleration and deceleration times and, and look to see where we were, where are we point one, where are we point two. And to me again, there's a little bit of variability, but it's a pretty accurate device as far as what we get. We've tested it against motion capture, so we know we're getting some good information. But for me, if I'm within 10%, things are looking really good. Sort of the newest thing to the, fa the family that we do is kinematic testing. Uh, when I had the office do this for me, they did their cameras upright instead of landscape. Hence, it does look like a news show, blood out of the side. But I could do something as very simple as a squat. And notice here, looking at the screen, Here's the individual being digitized with the device itself, picking up landmarks on the body. Here's another one as an example with the landmarks of the body going up and down a squat. I can go through a number of squats, four or five squats. I'll just jump to the next slide so I have it up here. But you'll notice here's the information I get coming back. I can see trunk lane, varus, varus or valgus angulation at the knee when they go into the squat, tibia angle or dorsiflexion, it's a, the numbers are, uh, you have to think of it inverted how this works, but you can see the numbers, uh, flexion angles for the knee, what they're going down to, so it gives me data on a squat. Now I can also do a single leg squat if I wanted, I just happen to cho choose a bilateral squat to quickly make a video for the presentation, but I can do a single leg squat or I can do a drop down test. So if I sort of bring it back, I know I'm running short of my time. I've gone over Give me, but just a quick thing I wanted to say here again. For me, when I look at Tracer, uh -oh. I go back to my four questions, my key questions. Does the technology uh, provided or the information provided with Tracer help me over all my decision making? Resounding yes. Can you trust the information being provided? I've tested against motion capture and I can test it against various things. I know my numbers are, are fairly accurate when we look at that. Is it easy to analyze and use? Yeah, I don't even have to do anything. <laughs> there is no analyzation because the computer does it for me. It pops right up and it drops into my patient record already or we print it out as a PDF, but it drops in there. And can you easily implement the technology into practice? Well, you saw in the last two or three videos how easy it is to use, especially when I did my vector test. I, nah, I'm going off of memory here. I think it was three clicks and I'm in collecting data on that. And once I enter, the, the longest part of doing a test or using it is the first time I work with a patient or my athlete, because I have to just put their information in so I have all their, their baseline information. But short of that, they're in the queue. I can pull them up anytime. So will this new technology inform and or change the delivery of care? Absol absolutely, because I've moved one step further in the process from my stopwatch to now giving me data, uh, analytical data that I can use that helps me to qualify the movement a little bit more. It's, there's steps we can go, there's other things we can do, but it's easy to use, it gives me those additional tools. So I just sort of go back to this slide, or saying something here, why do I wanna measure? I, I'll say it again. If you can't measure it, I can't control it. If I, you, know, you can't control it, you can't manage it, you can't improve it. And, and, and the other thing that's kind of interesting, it probably falls, this is a whole nother study, but it probably falls under our motivation aspect I was talking about a little, little bit ago. But here's the other thing that I do find clinically with this, particularly in the athletes, things you measure tend to improve. Think about that. Things you measure tend to improve. If I put values on this, they're always trying to beat their scores and working a little harder. Uh, the subjectivity is a hard one to do. Weight rooms, weights go up. They know what it is. They can see it. They're doing things. So the athletes or our patients see this and they're trying to get better scores all the time. So I do think that's a, a classic line there that if we're measuring it, we're probably going to manage it and we'll improve it. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Barry and uh, see if I can stop the share here with that and bring it back to you and, and let you take the sec next part. Well, I'm not sure what to say after that, Mike. I think you just covered all of our bases. <laughs> but, I don't know what you were talking on. More than we are. That's why we're blessed to be engaged with uh, such a brilliant mind. But I'm going to jump into the other into our lab here and then give you guys a brief uh, Tracer demo of some of the things we're doing today. A little bit of where we're going in the future and then uh, we'll do, open up the question and answer for the group to ask questions to either us or to uh, Mike specifically. So give me just one second I'll be in front of the camera in the uh, lab. So, so Mike one of the one of the questions that came up uh, was about how often do you use heart rate? Yeah I was just typing in uh, 
Um, I'll just hit send and I'll answer. The We oftentimes, I would say for me personally, and that's an area where, and I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to flat out give you the right answer, a little bit out of laziness on our part, because I don't use the heart rate monitor a lot to it, but where we have used it probably the most, and it's just situational with our clinic, it's with our NHL hockey players that we're rehabbing, and we'll use heart rate monitor to make sure we're getting up to a, a load that we want them to do and take them up and down. So um, it's been, you know, probably if I looked at all the athletes we do, it's probably less than, uh, I'm going to go to a big number, it's probably less than 25%, maybe even under 20. But it tends to be ones that I'm also using the tracer to give me a cardiovascular condition where we're pushing them to see what's going on. And I couldn't give you any definitive answer on this one, but Obviously, uh, if I push you hard enough and I, I'm, the load I'm measuring is the heart rate, so we're trying to get you to a training zone, um, what I'm really looking for there is I know how hard I'm pushing you. Does that change the parameters of reaction, speed, acceleration, deceleration? Uh, the other things we oftentimes do to cheat it a little bit with our, um, that I cheat it with my heart rate monitors is we'll run you through a whole battery of tests or maybe run you through a, a 90 second to two minute test, um, give them a quick chance to recuperate and then rerun it again and see if our numbers start to change or what happens with fatigue. But to answer your question is, um, we do integrate it. Um, I tend to do it with our um, anaerobic type guys or hockey guys, just because it makes some sense to do that. But I probably could use it more uh, with that. And it's just to make sure I'm getting to a high, high enough heart rate that I've got a training load. Okay. I think Barry's going to jump on now. Uh, there was a question there, Craig, while Barry's jumping on, um, yeah. with Scott threw up there, I'm looking at the chats as they're coming up here. Um, with that, and by the way, I just looked who asked the question on heart rate. Connor Norman, they probably use it a bunch down there. I should let Connor answer that question <laughs> with that. My goodness. But uh, Scott, the, the, you, you bring up a great part. How do I speak with referring orthopods? Here's what I've found. I don't want to make it seem like I'm more knowledge about some, knowledgeable about something than they are. They're, they're, just think about it. They're trained to look at range of motion, strength, maybe a couple other parameters, but that's what they're trained in residency and fellowships to go through. What I've done with this, and, and, and it's, the learning curve is incredibly fast. What I've done is I've actually printed out the reports, a report on a patient. And I'll, when I visit the docs or I see them, I just show them the report and look at it. And I sort of explain what we're looking at. I, I'm fairly certain they don't know what a lot of it means. Uh, some of there. Uh, maybe I'm a bad job at explaining it. But they see, the, they see the graphs. And they can look at the graphs. And they see the differences on there. And they, they eat that stuff up. And uh, again, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And I think that's how they hold themselves to that as well. So it's another tool with that, but I've never had an orthopod that we work with look at this and say, well, that's the stupidest thing I've seen or, or not fully get it. They can just look at those pictures on our vector test or our lateral side to sides and see if there's a deficit right to left. Um, so I think that's a, to me, it's an easy one. It's, it's, it's show and tell and they grab it, they grasp it pretty quick. Hey, real quickly, can can Randy, as we get the speakers going in the lab, can uh, Randy Cohen, can you hear us? Or Craig, can you give him, I, I'd love to hear Randy's feedback on how he uses heart rate to answer that question. I know Randy uses it quite a bit and might be able to provide some further uh, information around that component. Hold on. I think I heard Randy. I'll look at him. Just go on his name and hit allow to talk. All right. Oh, let's see. There you go. Uh, Randy, everybody, and you're in a bowling alley. Or, uh, no, no, never mind. It's a training room. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought the same thing. <laughs> I, I did the bowling alley. <laughs> hey, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. I'm supposed to hang out in bowling alleys. Um, <clears throat> so, no, no. We actually, we do. You're, I, you're very, uh, you, you take this to the next level. I'd love to have the group hear your feedback on heart rate variability and such throughout. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I try to look at couple things with heart rate and try to do it often is look at um, number one especially concussion look at heart rate availability and and look at um, exercise intolerance um, and see how their, their heart rate goes up with with the activity but the other thing I like to see is um, if you're really looking at high level athletes the um, heart rate 
and the reaction time, the cognitive processing, does that decrease as they get fatigued? A, a highly trained athlete can, can maintain a incredibly high heart rate and continue to have the same reaction time and the same, um, you know, is the same acceleration, deceleration you hope. And I think that's one of the things we really truly need to look at because that's one of those risk factors, right? That would be a, Mike, that would be a risk factor I think you would look at. And I know it would be a Gary Wilkerson risk factor looking at, geez, when they fatigue, do they then cognitively process information slower? Do they react slower? Do they uh, accelerate and decelerate slower? That would be one of those things you say, hey, that's definitely a risk factor for uh, an an injury, a a re-injury. So I think that is, it's definitely something that we have to get a lot of data on. Um, but I definitely use it for all concussion, all concussion rehab and, and treatment we do on it. And I try to do it on all the orthopedic stuff and see if there is a variance when they get fatigued and when they get their high heart rate. Yeah, and I agree with you 100% on that. I think you're right. I just don't have, I don't have enough data drawn. You know, I could say 100% conclusion, but with you, I would say uh, anecdotally, I'll throw it out that way. Anecdotally, I agree with you 100%. I think there's a direct correlation to that. Uh, what we see, because certainly, uh, and again, it's not a reach for me to even figure this out in the real world. If we just watch athletes, just using co- to me common sense, but uh, we do know that one variable of injury is fatigue, or when people are fatigued, we tend to see some of that. Uh, it's not an always, but it does come into play. And I think you're exactly right. Um, and we do with some of our athletes. I should have thrown in there when Connor asked that question, uh, like you. What you're saying, I use heart rate variability uh, for our, as part of our the guys we have on a day-to-day basis to determine our training load for the day as well. How hard am I going to work you versus? I mean, if you've spent the last 24 hours in a, you know, you've been in a stress state, uh, there's no reason for me to push you hard today, no matter how you feel. Versus if you haven't been stressed or you're relaxed, we, we use it for a lot with that. But I agree with what you're saying, Randy. That I think there's a definite. I personally feel there's a correlation with that, and we're collecting that data. As, as you speak. I know others are doing the same thing, but we're, we're, we're analyzing it. Hey, Mike, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, since I'm on. Um, hey, what do you see uh, is a normal variance between your different categories that you would say, oh, statistically, I don't think this is significant, you know, percentage wise. And do you, do you have different ones in your mind for the percentage of difference between reaction time and speed and acceleration, deceleration? Um, do you have like difference? Say, oh, I don't think 5% is a big deal here. That's a normal variance I see pretty consistently. Or what, what's your thought on that? Yeah, great question. Great question. And we're gathering data on this. Um, for me, what my, as a, I'll give you the general rule of thumb but then I'm going to give you the academic answer of it depends as a general rule of thumb for me, I'm not too concerned. I don't start getting really concerned um, when they're, or I, I I'm happy if they're within 10% for me on, on some of our higher end. Now that that's my global overarching one, the 10% that I, that I like to see now having said that, cause some of them are way off. They're way more than that when we look at them. Um, so that's when we start to let them go st- return back to play uh, with some of our athletes what we'll do on some of our higher end ones and particularly ones that are doing a more cutting pivoting twisting type activities I, I tighten that down a little bit I, I, I'm not as concerned when it's under 10 but I then and this is anecdotal now what I'm telling you we tend to go to the five percent mark and and I want to get them within five percent but the reality of it is here's the crazy thing um, Again, I see unilateral problems in general, so, I, I, so I'm doing musculoskeletal. So the crazy thing is, most of my people that I work with, when it's all said and done, uh, when we're going through it, I, I do see that. <laughs> this, is, this is another problem. I do see that five to ten percent difference, but it tends to be to the uninvolved side. In other words, everything I measure and look at from their involved side that was a deficit before, because they've been working at it so hard and they're seeing their numbers and they're trying to beat things they whether it be motor learning motor control or physical they do they tend to get better on that side so um the one athlete i showed earlier that i was been doing stuff with that person is slowly creeping outside the 10 percent window and i want to see symmetry but it's 10 percent to the good uh, the involved side is that much better than the uninvolved so 
I, I didn't give you a great answer, but my global number is 10. My elite athletes, I start to push it to five. Awesome. Go ahead, Barry. You can take another five if you want. I was going to say, I might have two left now, Mike. <laughs> I think everybody between you and Randy, I think we've covered virtually everything. But yeah, we'll take over. I, I appreciate it. So let me, let me jump in real quick into the group. We appreciate the time. I won't keep you for another five, more than five minutes, and then we'll try to answer some more questions. But real briefly, there's probably 25% of the call that have already seen Tracer, actually have Tracer. Um, they're existing parts of the Tracer family. And so this will be a little bit of uh, an update for you all, and then it'll be something maybe new for the rest of the group on the call. Um, what you're looking at here is the Tracer screen. You saw it in Mike's uh, clinical lab there at the National Hip Institute. They have a beautiful 75-inch TV. They mounted into the wall at the showcase piece with a small hardware component mounted underneath. Uh, the Georgia guys have something similar. I think it's about a 70-inch, 75-inch TV with Tracer mounted underneath so that it's a non-dedicated space in front of Tracer. And really, it comes down to using one high-powered optical camera, to Mike's point earlier in the conversation, in conjunction with simulation, you'll see here on the screen, and we're really looking at the ability to objectively quantify human health and performance in very unique ways. And there's, what we look at is, and Mike touched on this as well, like I said, Mike sort of covered all of our bases, but four key pillars, one being balance, and objectively quanti quantifying balance in very unique ways, very sensitively and objectively. So if you take the best test, the BESS, balance air scoring system, uh, I, I'm sure the most of the call is familiarized with what the best is. I can't tell you how many times I've heard from some of the best clinicians in the space. Very, the best test is not the best test. And a lot of the times it's because it's so subjective. Next to impossible for a clinician to look from the feet to the eyes, and the six air measurements, and then looking at instability or sway simultaneously, it's very hard to do objectively without using something like Tracer. So we can objectively quantify balance modalities, and whether that's for a eight-year-old or a hundred-year-old or anybody in between, we have different levels of balance modalities that allow us to objectively quantify balance very sensitively and objectively. Then we'll move into kinematics, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of kinematics here shortly. Mike showed a video already, so we sort of touched on that but you can rapidly integrate anybody into any of these modalities in about three seconds. So there's nothing attached to the body, it's rapid integration, and allows us, and allows you as a clinician or as an organization to rapidly integrate somebody, be very time efficient, and get objective outcome measures very rapidly. Um, and right now, from a kinematic standpoint, we're looking at a single leg squat, a double leg squat to Mike's point, and then a vertical drop jump. And looking at really these uh, six measurement constructs, Doors of flexion in the ankle, tibia angle, valgus varus in the knees, trunk flexion, and uh, pelvic tilt. And now we're adding in hip flexion due to Mike and Ashley there at the clinic in Nashville's recommendations. So we'll look at those components. Uh, we then really, really cut our teeth is on this dynamic movement and providing a reactive based environment. So and Mike was really responsible or very early on in the late 90s, early 2000s for helping us realize how important it was for a clinician to be able to provide an analogous environment, realistic to the real world, put that patient in that environment, and then look at their ability to move like they would in the real world and to react like they would in the real world. The real world and, and everyday life is not lived in the sagittal plane, and we're always working in a sagittal plane, working on a bike, a treadmill, an elliptical. That's not analogous to the real world. We have to move side to side, forward, backward. We have to react. And so that's where Tracer can really help to bridge the gap between rehabilitation and return to function, for example, where we can actually put somebody in a simulation and look at their ability to navigate that space like they would in the real world and then quantify where they're at today and where they need to be in the future and track that linear path, hopefully seeing the degradation and deficiency from where they were day one to the objective outcome week eight, for example. Uh, really where we're going now is this neuromechanical realm, and that's what I'm gonna show you today um, in more detail, looking at the integration of the brain and body simultaneously. So how well does your brain process information like math problems, like the Struve test, like the flanker, and then also look at musculoskeletal uh, performance at the same time. So as you solve problems, those math problems or the Struve test, how well do you, you then function from a musculoskeletal standpoint? Do you have any degradations or deficiencies? So let me just show you briefly. I'm going to show you three different 
uh, aspects of Tracer quickly. And then I'm going to turn it back over to question and answer because we have very limited time. But I'll start on the, um, I'm going to show you the RAS90. What we've done now, and this is new to even those that are on the phone that have Tracer, and I'm excited for you to have this. So you'll see here, you can choose a scene. What environment do you want that participant to be in? So here's a hockey rink that I'm going to actually use. We have a tennis court. Uh, you have a beach environment, very peaceful. We use this a lot in the senior population. Um, a new football field, a tennis, or like a uh, gymnasium type facility. And again, so you can choose the environment. So I'm gonna use a hockey court and I'm gonna look at the RAS90, which is the reactive agility springs. So we're looking at an individual's ability to move and react, accelerate, decelerate, how fast they move, and how magical they are in their ability to do so. So you'll see, I'll stand on this circle for three seconds. Our hockey rink, and we have actual hockey players doing this on the rink. And I have to react and don't look at my athleticism, please, because it's very pathetic. But you'll see it. We'll put them in the environment and look at how they respond to these cues within that environment that's analogous to what they would return to, to the field of play or to life. Uh, and so that gives you just a little sense. And again, we'll quantify acceleration, deceleration, heart rate, speed, all these factors. And then look at the asymmetry scores as well be able to then track that individual throughout the life cycle of the rehabilitative process. I'll show you neuromechanics, which we're really excited about. And again, hey Barry, that was pretty amazing that you were in the minor leagues there at the Eastern Hockey League, but here in Nashville, we're in the, the NHL. So you don't think I'm an NHL player, huh, Mike? No, the rink you're in said Eastern Hockey League. <laughs> you got to step yeah, up. Okay, well, watch my flanker reaction time, okay? <laughs> This is everything you need to know. So it's not about muscle skeletal performance, to Mike's point. It's about the brain, right? So how well is your brain and body connected? This is, Mike, where I'm going to really perform at a high level here. All right, so we're focused on the center arrow. So if everybody's not on the call, familiarize with the flanker. I'm reacting. There's five arrows, greater than or less than signs. I'm going to put that one up. I'm certainly not ready for the NHL, Mike. Uh, but there's... Greater than less sign, I'm focused on the center arrow. So whatever direction that center arrow is pointing is the direction I'm going to react. So now we're looking at choice reaction times as well as whole body reaction times, how well I see, process, and then execute from a motor standpoint. And then I'm looking at my musculoskeletal function as well simultaneously. And so this is really exciting, looking at that connection between the brain and body for both rehabilitation training and assessment of that individual, whether it's, again, a five-year-old or 105-year-old or anybody in between. I'm going to have to catch my breath, so give me one second. Mike, you have anything good to say? Yeah, there's, a, there's an adult league in Cleveland that might be looking for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for rubbing it in. <laughs> All right, so now quickly, I'm just going to show the group kinematics, and then we'll open it up to a little bit more question and answer. <laughs> Here's a double leg squat. Again, very simplistic. So I can integrate somebody in three seconds and look at their kinematic output. You'll see I'm just going to stand in front of the camera, calibrate, and just begin squat. You'll see the reps. I'm supposed to do 10 reps. I'm not going to do them all. Again, you have the immediate biofeedback on the right side. So you as a clinician can track that or see that, or your patient can if you want to. I'm done. Uh, so I did my I did my six squats, finish. You get an immediate output. Again, they compare and contrast time after time. And what we're working on now is inserting norms into that category. And so, without taking up too much more of your time, I wanted to give a high level overview of where we're going. We're excited to get the new version with the new screens, the new avatars, uh, in regards to the neuromechanics dynamic movement out to the group that already has Fraser. Uh, we'd love to talk to the rest of the group about how to get Tracer integrated into your organization. Uh, but let's open up some more question and answer and make sure we close off on a good note to answer everybody's questions that they might have. Craig, do we have additional questions from the group? Um, I'm not, we've been kind of answering them in chat um, as we've been going on just some specific questions. Um, one, I know Scott Sinek had a question. One question for Mike. How, how do you, in, you know, with your, you have existing protocols that you've used. How do you integrate the technology 
into those protocols? You know, is that at the beginning? Is it after you've kind of gotten the limb stronger? What, what stage do you integrate it into, into your protocol? A great question, but I'm going to give a bad answer probably. The, uh, <laughs> it, it, we integrate the tray. If you really think about the things we can measure and, and look at with Tracer, um, we integrate it early on. So if, we're, if a person is asking in this regard, we have like phase one, two, three, and four, typically of rehab, things along those lines. Um, there are activities <clears throat> that you can do within the Tracer and on the protocols that certainly are both low level stress to the person. And I like to get them in, I like to A, get the person weight bearing as quick as we can, as long as we're allowed. So obviously we're gonna make a big jump here. We're now allowed full weight bearing on the involved side or whatever we're doing. If we get to that point, I incorporate the trays early on. For example, uh, low level activities that I could start incorporating this as a part of my treatment would be a lot of the balance testing and some of those things. Even what Barry just showed, our squat activity, I can start doing squats as soon as the person's weight bearing. So we can do that. So on my kinematic tests and or my low level kinematic tests or some of my balance activities and things along those lines, I can start those right away. Now, as my rehab progresses and we become more dynamic in the rehabilitation process, so the tool will be used throughout the entire process, I guess would be the one answer. But as we're able to move into uh, phase three or four or late stage rehab, that's when I get into the more dynamic testing and high speed testing where we're doing the um, side to side, our lateral agilities or our vector testing. So I can use this early on. I mean, think about the squat. As soon as you're weight bearing, let's start working on proper squat mechanics and start looking at those things. That's motor learning. So I'm starting my motor learning early on. And we even in integrate this directly in with force plates. I can see force stuff with I'm doing the same time. So the answer is I can integrate it across the whole spectrum when we do it and it gets them used to using the device. Okay, um, another question from uh, Colin. Is a sequence of the reaction protocol, this is for you, Barry, is the sequence of the reaction protocol the same for every patient? If not the same exact test, how can it be used comparatively? Yeah, that's a great question. And so it is the same exact test, just different amplitudes. So we'll have a, it could be a senior, Colin, uh, it's a great question. It could be a senior that it's using a four-legged walker, doing the same lateral agility screen as Tua is, looking at his ankle rehabilitation. Hypothetically, Barry, hypothetically. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothet yeah, hypothetically, it could be this, it is the same. It's just they're do moving at very different speeds. <laughs> so I'll give you a quick uh, anecdotal story and I'll make it real brief. We had an 87-year-old senior with one of our senior uh, assisted living sites down in Florida. Luke came in day one, and in 90 seconds on the reactive agility screen, only hit three targets. To give you an example, most of the Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, Arizona guys will hit 55 to 60 targets in 90 seconds. So the poor Luke just came off a hip, uh, breaking, uh, hip uh, replacement, had a uh, hip uh, fall, contusion on his face. And uh, Luke, we got a call from the clinician three weeks later. He was on a four-legged walker day one. He come, comes in for rehab three days a week. Three weeks later, she calls us. She goes, you're not going to believe this, but he went from three targets and a four-legged walker to 18 targets in three weeks, got rid of the four-legged walker, was onto a cane, um, and improved his reaction time, gait speed, deceleration, acceleration by 300 to 500% in three weeks. And so Luke was, uh, did, they did their own internal testimonial they shared with us. And Luke said, most importantly for him, he was able to stop himself from falling twice because he was able to recognize that and then appropriately react and decelerate to stop himself from falling. And so that's the impact. I guess that any of these modalities can be used by anybody, virtually anybody. We've had people in wheelchairs use them. It's just going to give you different outputs based on ailment and based on um, age, obviously. And that's where we're categorizing norms specifically to those people. Okay. Um, any plans uh, from, from Logan? Um, any plans for to have norms? Yeah, we're, we're spending a lot three of Three norms to test on it. Um, and we're working with a lot of really uh, progressive, prominent groups on the data side to insert norms both into Tracer's, um, at the Tracer unit itself, so that wherever you're using the technology, you'll have those norms integrated, and then have 
deeper access and comparative access in regards to norms on the website. And uh, that's something in the near term that we'll be launching. I can't give you an exact time frame, but we're building those in now. We've got substantial data on, on most populations. Middle-aged populations are probably our weakest. We have substantial data on uh, high school, college uh, athletes, as well as the senior population now that we're gonna button up and get out to the general public here in the near term. Okay. I think I'm all I'm I'm all caught up on the questions here, Barry. I saw one more question. Oh, wait, hold on, sorry, sorry. I, I, there's a couple more on the other end. Uh, so Daniel Bellamy asked, uh, "How do you adjust the background?" Daniel, that's gonna I, I can't hear you. I don't think, but uh, just so you know, that's gonna be with the new launch of uh, the new version here within the next four weeks. We'll launch that out to everybody that already has Tracer. Anybody new that gets it will have the ability. We have different avatars now. Um, so whether it's female, whether it's racial, you know, whether it's ethnicity, um, you can choose your avatar for that particular person's profile. And as you can also choose the environment very simplistically, rapidly based on, so you can either enter that at the front end of the patient profile. So if it's a volleyball player, you put them on a volleyball court or a tennis player in a tennis court or a football player in a football field. So that automatically comes up to that or you can just rapidly change the environment uh, with one qu quick click of the scene uh, while, when you're launching that particular modality for that patient. Here's one more, Barry, that I just sure. got. Are there any thoughts on adding a weight distri distribution component? For example, looking at the double leg, looking at that double leg squat, seeing if weight is distributed equally. My, you know, that's, um, we, Mike and I have talked about that a little bit, looking at like uh, force displacement under the feet. Mike, do you want to address that? Yeah, we do. We do that all the time. And in some of them, a matter of fact, in my one video with showing the person going side to side, our body tracks were up against the wall. We use body track. Um, we've had various little things and I'll have the person do their kinematic testing while standing. It's just, it looks like a doormat, but it's instrumented. <clears throat> and we have them do their activities. And so the other things I do pick up with that is exactly what the question is, weight shifting right, left, and or I can see the weight, so I, it's center of pressure is basically what I'm measuring. Although with some of the new technology, we're even getting vector forces coming off of it now. It's, it's a, you have to think outside the box on how to get that, but we are getting vector forces when they do it. I'm probably most concerned about right, left weight shift and anterior, posterior, on their toes, so I want to see how they're sitting back or dropping forward. So the answer is yes, I integrate it all the time. Uh, Barry's seen that in the clinic, that's where we've talked about it, I know, where you've watched them on there, where we can sure. pick that data up as well. So the answer is yes, I do it. Okay. Well, I think I've tried to go between the chat and the Q&A, and I, I think we're all caught up. Fantastic. Well, if anybody out, first of all, we, we truly appreciate you guys joining us and, and hopefully this was valuable. We'd love any of your feedback to know if we should continue to do this on a consistent basis, bring in other renowned speakers that can lead. Uh, it could be on any topic, could be on any subject. And if, if anybody has suggestions, we'd love to hear those. Uh, Mike, we appreciate you more than you know. And, and it only goes up from here since you started with me. Well, I started with you. It and can only get better. Up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we got to get Ron on here, somebody with real yeah, credibility, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So Ron, maybe you're, maybe you could be next, man. But uh, we really appreciate y'all joining us. If there's any questions, anything else you guys want to know, be happy to answer those. We're full speed ahead. We're here to support you. And I really appreciate y'all joining us during this time and hope you all stay safe and healthy. Um, we thank you a ton for being here. So anything you need, please feel free to reach out. Mike or Craig, is there anything else you want to add uh, to the conversation before we jump? No, thank you so much for um, everybody. And uh, hopefully the any technical glitches weren't too bad on this uh, first run here. Mike? Very good. Thanks for having me. Stay Thanks, safe, guys. everybody. Really appreciate the time, everyone. Take care. Take care.